I'm going to teach you about the blood-brain barrier, what happens when it goes wrong, and why you should care. <laughs> the blood-brain barrier is a selectively permeable membrane that filters the blood entering and exiting the roughly three pounds of grayish jello that is your mind. Selectively permeable means the BBB only lets through certain substances like oxygen and carbon dioxide, necessary for your cells to breathe, or glucose, aka sugar, which is your brain's main fuel. Yummy. Not on the guest list are viruses and bacteria, which is why brain infections are considered rare, but not impossible. And most drugs, including antibiotics, which is why brain infections are so hard to treat when they happen. Three substances that actually have no problem crossing the BBB are ethanol, that's alcohol, caffeine, and nicotine, which explains a lot about people. But these three are not the only things messing with brains around the world on the daily. Some well-known viruses with bad reputations can disrupt and even break through the blood-brain barrier and cause major problems. One of those is human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. Statistically, you probably aren't living with HIV, but you likely have a much closer relationship with the newest brain-bothering virus in town, SARS-CoV-2. Yes, that's right, the virus that causes COVID-19. It can disrupt the blood-brain barrier, making it harder for your body to control what's coming in and out of your brain. It can also break through the BBB and set up shop in your head. Even if the virus doesn't infect your brain directly, it has a lot of different ways to trick your body into attacking your brain, aka neuroinflammation. And scientists have seen the results of this damage firsthand in study after study. It turns out that COVID messing with the brain is not rare. It's actually more like the norm. Hey, I know what you're thinking. But I had that and I'm fine. It pleases me to hear that. I hope you keep feeling fine, but the research makes me concerned about the future. It turns out that a single case of COVID-19, including mild or asymptomatic COVID, can do a lot of damage, regardless of whether someone feels fine. And these effects are likely cumulative, which means this is not a one and done thing. It's an each infection is an increased risk thing. Since you're scientifically minded, you'll stay a moment longer so I can share what I've learned, right? Okay, great. First, let's talk about the damage that COVID can cause even if your initial infection is mild or you're feeling fine. A UK study from 2022 compared a huge number of people's brain scans from before and after their infections, and their brains actually shrink. It turns out that your brain shrinking is a normal part of aging, and people lose 0.2 to 0.3% of their brain volume per year as they get older. However, the study participants lost an additional 0.2 to 2% of their brain volume, which is, in the best case, an extra year of brain aging from a single COVID infection, and in the worst case, a decade of brain aging from one infection. These results remained even when they removed the few patients who were hospitalized, so mild COVID can shrink your brain. The shrinkage was concentrated near the primary olfactory cortex, aka the smell zone. Have you ever heard someone say that scents are associated with strong memories because the memory part of the brain and the smell part of the brain are near each other? Well, that's true, and it's cause for concern. The authors of this study actually said that their results raised the possibility that longer-term consequences of SARS-CoV-2 infection might in time contribute to Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. No wonder that a few months after this study was published, a prominent American neuroscientist from the University of Chicago published an article saying that the data coming out of studies like these suggest a wave of post-COVID dementia in the coming decades, and that there is a pressing need for long-term studies of people who have recovered from mild COVID. But that's from 2022, so what have we learned since then? 
A Brazilian study just published in 2024 looked at people who had a confirmed mild infection approximately 80 to 90 days earlier. Researchers only chose subjects with no history of anxiety or depression before or after infection to make sure that any abnormalities they noticed couldn't be due to mental health concerns. The subjects had their cognitive abilities assessed by the researchers, which means a bunch of tasks like seeing how well you remember a short story, checking how many animals you can name in a minute, or how well you can copy one of these weirdo drawings. The researchers also took detailed scans of the subjects' brains and compared them to people who had never been infected. The results? The people who were mildly infected a few months earlier showed cognitive impairment, meaning they did not perform as well on the silly tests as they should have, and their MRIs showed microstructural abnormalities in their white matter, aka there was something weird going on in the tissue that connects the different parts of the brain and allows them to communicate. The researchers had this to say, the longitudinal analyses will clarify whether these alterations are temporary or permanent, which is scientists speak for, we don't know if this damage is permanent. Only time will tell. Not great. Another study just published compared the cognitive speed of long COVID patients to people who were infected previously but didn't have long COVID to people who had never been infected in both the UK and Germany. Participants did a very boring activity designed to test how fast they can react and think and how long they can pay attention. You can actually try it online yourself if you want to. Their results were classified as normal, moderately impaired or severely impaired in their reaction times. Only 4% of the no infection group showed severely impaired reaction times, but the number was 53.5% for the long COVID patients. According to the researchers, there's no way other conditions like trauma or sleep problems could cause such an extent of severe impairment in the long COVID group. This means that there is something going wrong in people with long COVID brains causing this impairment. But what about the group of people that had previous infections but no long COVID? If the virus wasn't damaging a lot of people's brains, we would expect this group to have about the same rate of severe impairment as the no infection group, 4%. But this group showed 19.4% severely impaired reaction speed, almost five times the rate of the no infection group, and nearly a fifth of the previously infected people without long COVID, which would suggest that there are a lot of people out there who do not identify as currently having long COVID whose thinking abilities have nonetheless been severely impacted due to some sort of underlying change in the brain. So what's going on? Are you saying that I might have brain damage that could be affecting me now or lead to dementia in the future and I don't know it? Unfortunately, yes. So there are limits to how much we can find out for sure about what COVID does to the human brain now because of ethics but it's easier for scientists to see damage up close in animal brains because, you know, they're allowed to. In a Korean study last year, researchers gave COVID to dogs and then let those dogs infect other dogs because there are actually striking similarities in the structure of human and canine brains and how we process information. So looking into dog brains can give us insight into our own. None of the dogs in the study displayed any symptoms of COVID, either respiratory or neurological. However, when the scientists checked under the hood, things were not okay. All of the dogs had brain damage. The virus was getting into the brain early in the infection and leading to a chain response of unhealthy changes that are the same sorts of changes documented in the super early phases of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. The researchers say that their evidence strongly suggests that even asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 patients might have neuropathologic changes in their brains, which could develop into severe neurologic disorders later in life. Um, and they're talking about people here, not dogs. All of these studies added together paint a picture that is really not good. Even if in the best case scenario, these changes the virus causes to the brain are temporary, they can heal on their own eventually. That doesn't help if we all keep getting infected two or three times a year, 
because your brain and body will never get the chance to heal fully. That doesn't mean things are hopeless though. We can stop the spread of this virus by wearing high quality masks now and updating our infrastructure with technology that can clean the air in the long term. We also need to stop forcing people to go to work and school when they're sick because all of the cutting edge research into the way this virus harms every part of our bodies shows that our current trajectory is unsustainable and we all deserve better than getting repeatedly infected with a brain damaging virus. Our best chance for healing involves minimizing the number of infections we get by stopping the spread of a SARS-CoV-2. In conclusion, thanks for coming to my presentation. If you still want to know more about the possible specific mechanisms of SARS-CoV-2 induced pathologic changes to the BBB and the brain, let me know in the comments and I will make a follow-up which goes into that more specifically.